Good to Hello. see you. Hello, next door. What an absolute well. pleasure. <laughs> How are you fellas doing today? Yeah, we're doing doing really well. Good. How are you doing over there? Uh, we are well. We are well. My wife is still here with me. She's sitting over there in the corner. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> What's your wife's yeah, name? Sorry Victor? about yesterday. We kind of got something happened outside and we kind of lost time and focus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no problem. Me, me and John just spend our lives on Zoom right now, Dexter, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're never off Zoom these days. <laughs> And where are you right now, dog? Dexter, are you at home right now? Yes, yes, I'm home. I'm, we're downstairs in our little studio. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking the plaques you've got in the background there. That's looking good. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's plaques <laughs> all over this place. Trust me. <laughs> what, what are some of those ones, Dexter? What, what are some of your pride and joy plaques? Well, uh, right now I got a Beam of Plaque, an Unsung Hero Award, and a number one black single, top hot rack singles. Hold on a second. <laughs> ah, yes, get the tour. We're getting the tour, John. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Awesome. <laughs> a selection. Wow. Oh, Nicki Minaj as well. There's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> What's your wife's name, Dexter? Judy. Hi, Judy. Hi, Judy. Yes, Judy. Hello Hi. from Glasgow, Scotland. <laughs> no, th yeah, thanks for taking time out thanks for taking time out Dexter to have a chat with us it's, we don't really know where to begin you have had a hell of a career haven't you <laughs> yeah yeah wow. yeah still going you know I just got done completed an album under my name featuring some wonderful uh, musicians and singers and so we're getting ready to try to get that out there figure out how to do that and um Brilliant. So, and I'm still performing. I was just in London back in early February, London and Paris. Right. At two of the venues there, and we did great shows. They were sold out, and right before the pandemic hit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we got back like February, uh, February the 13th. Right. And yeah. had we stayed a week longer, we would not have been able to get back. Wow. Oh, dear. Yeah. So have you been still working away in the studio throughout the, the pandemic and keeping yourself busy? Yeah, yeah, we've been taking it easy and, and really, we've really been playing safe because this is no joke, what, mm, yeah. what the world is seeing right now. Mm -hmm. and, it, and this virus, it adapts. So I'm finally happy they finally got, you know, new vaccines out there that are getting ready to be released in the next month or two, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think so that we can start vaccinating against it, and hopefully within a year, year and a half, things will be back to somewhat of a normal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Finally, looking like there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel. Be quite, I don't think things will ever be quite the same, you know. No. As long mm -hmm. as this virus is around, because it's sort of like what the flu was. It took us decades to really nail that down, and it still adapts, you know. Yeah, some yeah. people, you know, some of the adaptations, the the vaccinations you get don't work as well anymore, mm -hmm. you know. So people still get it. Yeah, definitely. That's it. I think it's been a, a time to reflect this year. I think, and a lot of people have just taken time to use it in different ways, haven't they? Try to be as yeah. produ productive as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I once made it to Edinburgh. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. the capital. Beautiful yeah, yeah, yeah nice. we made it there. We did a show there. It was me, Billy Paul, Gene and Gene Carn. Yeah, we did oh, a show yeah. in Edinburgh. Wait, when was and that? that was an when underground was that? city or something that I got to see. Oh, the it, vault. Uh, the vault. Yeah, underground, it, under, oh, under yeah. Vault. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. It was amazing. And I got my wife one of those Scottish cake. Coats and oh, she, yeah. to this day she loves it. She still wears it. And this is like a decade or two later. <laughs> <laughs> Scotland gets into your heart, Dick. So it gets into your Scotland heart. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it, and uh, I would have loved to have gotten more out into the countryside and seen that aspect of Scotland. You know. Yeah, we've got beautiful scenery over here. The countryside is amazing. Yeah, I was. Uh, we were in a. We took a train. Uh, to Edinburgh and um, 
uh, about an hour, hour and a half into the ride, we were up in the highlands and it started snowing. And the next thing I knew, we were stuck for six hours right. on the train in a, a real bad <laughs> snowstorm. <laughs> that sounds like Scotland. That really does sound like Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah, it was wonderful. I enjoyed next, being next there. year. Next year, Dexter, you'll have to come back over. You and Judy, and we'll, we'll go up to the Highlands again. Don't worry about that. We'll do it all over again. All right, Paul. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you based right now, Dexter? We are based in a little town in Pennsylvania called Elverson, Pennsylvania. All right. Okay. Brilliant. Where, where, where did it all kind of begin for you then, Dexter? Where, where was it you kind of got into the, what inspired you to get into the music industry? Where were you starting out? Where did you learn the craft then? Well, how I really started was I was um, a little, as a little boy, I was an errand boy. See you, hon. See you. Bye, yeah. Judy. See Bye. you, Jason. Nice meeting you. Nice to meet oh, you. We'll see you next year oh, in Glasgow. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Happy holiday. Yeah, you too. Uh, so what happened was I started out when I was eight years old. I started out being a little gopher boy, a little errand boy at yeah. a theater in Philadelphia called the Uptown Theater, which was in many ways like the Apollo in New York or the Regal in Chicago. And it had all of these great uh, black entertainer shows come through because there were very few theaters in the United States like that at, at the time because of segregation, you know. Yeah. So it was a real home, good home base. And the, um, the uh, music director at the time was called, was named Doc Bagby. And he was an organ player. And um, he came up with some really good music. But anyway, he showed me my first chords on the organ. Him and Dave Babe Cortez showed me my first chords. And from there, I just I just would just hang around with all the musicians and yeah. uh, learn. And they would show me stuff. And um, when the Isley Brothers came through, Jimi Hendrix was their guitar player. Wow. And oh, yeah. Jimmy would show me chords on the guitar. And we would hang out together because he was real quiet. Mm -hmm. And uh, other people would show me um, chords on the keyboards. Um, uh, at the time, and uh, I, I, that's where it all began for me. And yeah. uh, working with all of those artists uh, was just an amazing. So I, I became a big fan of music and of recording artists uh, as a young mm -hmm. boy, and that's really what got me started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good influence. He's right there, isn't it? Learning music from Jimi Hendrix is a good <laughs> place to start, isn't it? <laughs> well, my first little chords, I really didn't learn the chords on the guitar like that, but on the keyboard, I did. Oh yeah, but yeah. Tagged me because he wasn't playing. He said, "No, put your fingers like this. Play like that. You know, and all that kind of stuff. You know." So then, by the time I was in junior high school, I was taking theory, harmony, and composition, and playing the cello, flute. And uh, stuff like that, playing in orchestras and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. You're looking over your catalogue of music and it's just it's unbelievable just the amount of people you've worked with and it just sounds incredible. Who's, who's do you think, has been your highlights to work with over the years? Well, I don't think there's really been any highlights. I think there's been great friendships for mm -hmm. me in my heart. You know, like um, I became very close with... Um, um, numerous artists, you know, over the decades um, um, that became close friends, like with Lou Rawls or Billy Paul, my kids called them Uncle Lou and Uncle Billy. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that was the real highlight yeah. for me, you know, and and uh, as a, a, from a personal aspect, mm -hmm. you know. Lou, Lou, and Rose a, a voice. Lou, Lou, Rose, Lou Rawls' voice, Dexter. How good is Lou Rawls' voice, though? That is just like something really special, isn't it? What, what an actor he was. Oh, yeah, sure, he was very special. And uh, even early in his career, you know, yeah. he was with a, a gospel group called the Pilgrim Travelers. And on the road, that's how he met Sam Cooke. You know, and Sam Cooke really loved his voice. Yeah. And uh, Sam Cooke has a record out called Bring It On Home. Bring It On Home to Me. And it and it's actually two voices. It's Sam and it's Lou. Oh, really? and most people don't know that, you know. <laughs> That's a great song as well. I love that song. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, yeah, so Lou's voice was um, it, it was amazing, and of course he had a great career. 
yep. uh, with hits early on, like Tobacco Road and Natural Man. And then when he came to Philly International Records, yep. I got to work with him as a producer, writer, arranger. You know, I got to work on his uh, first album. I, I actually, when he left PIR, I became the executive producer for that album he did at CBS called Close Company. You know, I put that album together for him, you know. Mm -hmm. And so our friendship uh, was very deep. Um, and his voice was just amazing. You yeah. know, if you listen to his voice, he had a, a voice that really expressed how he felt, you know. Um, and and that, that, was, that, was a, that was always wonderful to hear and, and to feel, you know, was his voice when he sang. There's a realness. There was a, a realness to the to the songs, isn't there? Just when he when he was singing, it was like he was talking to you. I think wasn't it? There was a realness in the music. Exactly. What what a magical time, Dex, as well. Around that time in Philadelphia, around the seventies. Me and John always we always look back. Our generation, when we wish we could have captured a little bit of that magic, and we we just we, we utmost respect for that for that era and music. It was such a, a a magnificent time, wasn't it? Yes, it was. That PIR was a magnificent time. Yeah. There were many. And also what I'd like to talk about to you is that the recording studio in Philadelphia was called Sigma Sound Recording Studios, the most important one. Right. There were other recording studios in Philadelphia that various artists, producers used. But Sigma Sound Recording Studio that was founded by Joe Tarzia, Right. Uh, was made a historical site the other day in Philadelphia. And uh, so many great artists went through there. Um, um, I, I, all the Philly International recording artists recorded at, at Sigma Sound Studios. And then other artists went through there from all over the world and recorded there, you know. And I was proud to be a part of their legacy as, yeah. par as far as what I did um, Early on, like one of my first sessions at Sigma was back in 1972. They had a uh, Putney synthesizer, and I was sitting uh, uh, waiting for someone to use me on the piano on a session. Right. And they asked me if I knew anything about the Putney synthesizer. And I said, sure. Of course I didn't, but I went up there. <laughs> <laughs> and I came up with some sounds, took the little pegs and turned the knobs and came up with some sounds. And before I knew it, they were hiring me at $50 a session to mm -hmm. program their Putney, you know. And, um, and that's how I really got started at Sigma. And then being there, I got to meet other producers and other members of MFSB and stuff like that and became a member of a group that two of the members of MFSB asked me to join. That was Yellow Sunshine yeah, back yeah. in 1972. So I joined Yellow Sunshine and it all kind of lifted up from there. Yeah. I, w I was going to ask you about your kind of love of synthesizers. I wasn't sure where it began or how you actually learned, but I guess you just kind of get stuck in and because you had access to it in the studio, you just... Uh, Good stuff. Well, with the Putney, I actually had to figure out the Putney on my own. But yeah. when I got the ARP 2600 from Al Perlman back in 74, yeah. he would get on the phone with me and kind of give me directions of how to, you know, coordinate the AD ADSRs with the oscillators or the yep. envelope generators, you know. And, and that was a great synthesizer because it was a suitcase synthesizer. It was still monophonic. Yep. But it was great. The tones and the sounds you could get out of it were yeah. incredible, you know. Yeah. And I used to help Bob Moog's people set up their synthesizers when they would come through Sigma because, you know, they had uh, uh, modules that had to be plugged in, you know, yeah, like yeah. that, yeah. And separate, you know, and then had to be stood up, you know. So, yeah, and I had fun doing that, too. So synthesis was really what got me started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you were one of the, the early adopters of the synthesizers and actually putting them on recordings and doing some great things with them, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were people back in the late 60s, in the 60s, that were doing synthesis, but not too many. You know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Walter Carlos, um, I think it's on my, my little bio that Judy made or sent you guys. So I, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I love synthesis, uh, and I became a big fan of Iseo Tomita. Mm -hmm. He was he was a synth synthesis from Japan, and he um, did an album called Snowflakes Are Are Dancing, which was um, 
he he did the works of um, the composer that did Claire de Lune and all that stuff. I can't think right now of, of mm. the names, but uh, I love that album and it really solidified my interest in synthesis. And when I got to PIR, the one thing I realized at PIR, they had uh, some of the greatest uh, orchestrator producers working out of there, like um, uh, Gamble and Huff, and um, who owned PIR, and uh, Tom Bell, who was a producer arranger that was just unbelievable, and Bobby Martin, of course, you know, that did all of this arrangements early on for Gamble and Huff, and I and and I knew that I really couldn't kind of compete with what they did because I mean all that stuff was just so amazing what Tom Bell did with the um, uh, stylistics and the spinners and what uh, Bobby Martin did with uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes and the OJs those arrangements are totally incredible so yeah, yeah. I, I what I did starting out as an arranger and Billy Bill, Billy Paul always said to me you know I think that kind of makes you different so I really tried to incorporate synthesis with my orchestrations and arrangements that I wrote, which hopefully, helpfully did make me a little different. And the producers would try that out. Sometimes they'd like it. Yeah. Sometimes they wouldn't, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. uh, so mixing synthesis with my uh, with my orchestrations and arranging really helped me identify and uh, give me uh, an identity. Yeah, I, th I think it was the way you used the synth in such an <clears throat> atmospheric way as well. It created a real feel underlying in the track as well, rather than just using them to, to accommodate other instruments. They kind of created this vibe and this great feel that still sounds timeless, even to listen to today, sounds as fresh as ever, I feel. So I think you've done a good job. Considering you were just messing around on them, Dexter, you've done a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I had to, um, I tried to, I tried to be different. So yeah. when you listen to stuff I did with MFSB or the Jones Girls or my own albums or Billy Paul, you know, yep. you'll hear a difference. You'll hear yep. synthesis that yep. you won't hear on um, on most of the other tracks, you know, unless I helped a producer, unless a producer asked me to do synthesis for them or write their arrangements or something like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. You must have an impressive collection of synthesizers by now as well over the years. I, I, had, uh, I had about nine different synthesizers, but they're all gone. Mm -hmm. I didn't collect, uh, uh, I didn't, um, uh, I didn't keep them. I passed them on, you know, oh, to right. people that wanted them, you know, that wanted to be, uh, to use them or, you know, have them. Mm -hmm. Same way with other instruments. I had other gu uh, guitars. I used, I used to play guitars on sessions and, I don't do that anymore, of course, um, oh. and I pass those on too. And um, and besides, I really think that software synthesis has done a good job, really coming up with the sounds. Most of the yeah. keyboards you get now have presets that give uh, that you can alter to create sounds. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah, I was and, actually wanting to ask you about that with with the amount of experience that you have with synths. Like, how do you compare? listening to the old hardware synths with the new software synths? Do you think it's just as comparable now as it was then? Well, there, of course, is a difference between analog and digital. You know what I'm saying? Like plugging a synth into a system to make it work is one thing, but having it come out of a di digital piece of equipment is another thing. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. But I, I think that over the years it's come together you know, in ways that uh, allow me to continue to work without having to go through. Don't forget, early synthesis was monophonic. Mm -hmm. That means that that you had to play one note at a time, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, well, and, and make it work that way, you know. Yeah. And of course, then polythonic, poly or, you know, where you could play more than one note at a time. The first synthesizer I had where I could play more than uh, one note at, at a time was the uh, Oberheim, the oh, four voice. Yeah. You know, so I could play four notes at one time. <laughs> that was back in 76, then, you know. Yeah. <laughs> also not been able to save presets either. So you've always got to remember <laughs> no where presets, the settings are. Yeah. <laughs> no, it had modules built in right there. And you had to, of course, you know, do the modules. But I'm going to tell you something. When Bob Moog uh, put out that mini Moog, that really changed a lot of things, you know, mm, because yeah. the mini Moog, uh, people really loved the sound of the basic sign and then the... Uh, the bass sounds you could get and create out of it. All the yeah. R&B groups at some point started using those mini Moog sounds and to yeah. a great degree, some of the um, uh, ARP sounds. But 
yeah. when Yamaha came out with that first uh, synth keyboard, that, that really changed the game because then you could get uh, orchestral sounds, horns and strings and mm -hmm. winds and stuff like that, you know, along with synths and piano and organ all on wooden keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> So that was real helpful, especially if you if you didn't have a budget to bring in strings and horns, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which which kind of like uh, changed the game. Yeah, I think as as the music technology started to progress and roll into the sampling era of the eighties and things, and it just created a it flipped the whole music industry upside down. I think didn't it as the yeah, technology yeah. progressed? It, what a, what a change! Eh? <laughs> sampling sampling really changed the game big time because yeah. and i understand why because people couldn't afford a big productions you know where you had many many players and many many you know instrumentalists and stuff like that if you sampled something that you liked and if you added a, some basic drums to it you could rap to it you could sing to it and you'd have your mm -hmm. own sound you know yeah. and unfortunately early on samples did not pay for the for the writers that that created the music you know it wasn't until the early 90s that legislation was created where sampling had to be licensed yep. you know so that people could get paid and that's that's a good thing i have a track um called a theme from the planets the intro that um daryl brown the great drummer that i worked with early on yep. who has recently passed away um that's been sampled. Uh, um, Sony says it's been sampled over 500 times, but other people say it was sampled that much, if not more, early on before licensing, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, your exactly. music has been sampled so much by so many other prolific artists as well, you know, with like the Chemical Brothers, Jay-Z, KRS-One. You know, there's so many people have taken inspiration from your music and, and kind of done their thing with it as well, which is, a, is an amazing thing as well. Yeah, yeah, and I really appreciate it. You know, I'm I'm glad that you know for all of us who, who have been a part of the music, all the musicians and singers and producers and writers and in studio engineers, it's so important that uh, our music is still a part of of what people want to hear, and no matter which way they hear it, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I I think that's wonderful. Yeah. I think it's a really exciting time in music again because we're looking back towards all that that great effort and all the the standard that was set in this throughout the 70s and trying to maybe capture a bit of that magic again you know the sampling thing still gets used obviously in its own way but i think if people are trying to incorporate the live musicians again and just capture a bit more of that magic again and write original material you know yeah absolutely and it's i think it's wonderful i yeah. think that i'm hearing a lot of new young groups out there that are real groups as opposed to, you know, um, a, sa a sample process, you know, where they've played their own instruments and, and vocalized and s some of that stuff sounds incredible and I really like it, you know? Yeah, definitely. What, what, what do you think in the, uh, the modern era then, Dexter, with this whole, uh, the way we stream music and the way we actually access music, you know, and I know there's a lot of kind of, questions asked about people getting dues again and getting their, their royalties paid because it's it's so accessible now but there's not a lot of money generated from the way people listen to music now is there it's such a different era well it is it is financially it's a bit more difficult but at the same time streaming it's has found its way yeah uh, and i think this new generation streaming has become even more important you know, than going out and getting CDs or anything like that. It's like a lot of the artists, the big artists that go out there, like my son was telling me one day that um, how one of the artists he he produces, uh, um, I can't think of her name, Ariana Grande. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when she goes out, she tries to sell CDs, and that doesn't work quite as well, but thumb drives works great. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? <laughs> So I'm saying thumb drives, really? Oh, well, that's that. <laughs> that's interesting. But yeah, streaming streaming has um, really kind of taken over, you know, yeah. in, in great ways because people are on their phones, they're on their pads, yeah. they're on their computers now more than ever, and yeah. that's not going away. Mm -hmm. But at least company uh, the the um, the sources out there that collect 
licensings and stuff like that are getting on top of it now, you know, more so than they were 10 years ago or even five years ago for that matter. You know, so it's, it's becoming a new source for uh, artists and uh, well, mainly right now, basically uh, the writers. Uh, But now there's legislation out there that that will allow artists to get paid too, you know, Uh, because generally when something gets played on the radio or, or streamed, It's the writers and the publishers that get money for the most part, unless it's on TV. If it's on TV, then licensing has gone up to where the producers get some money now. You know, before producers weren't getting any licensing. And um, and uh, I I think even artists now can get some some um, licensing fees from uh, productions, movies, TV shows, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, It seems almost like the with how accessible that music is now through streaming services, it's almost kind of devalued in a sense, like in a monetary sense, but that I mean the artistic credibility and the artistic value is still there. But in terms of people actually making a living from it, it seems to be a lot more difficult now than what it may have been before. Well, I, I agree with you, but then uh, there's one thing I can say about that. Yes, I agree. I think, I think that for artists from, say, like my my time or, and or up until the 2000s, uh, yeah, it's more difficult for us to get performances and stuff like that based on streaming or uh, streaming helping us. But some of these new artists, mm-hmm. uh, streaming is everything. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? For some of the new artists, if you don't get streamed and if your album doesn't pop up, on Spotify or iTunes or, you know, that way, or one of those geezer or whatever, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> yeah. then you're not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, <that's> <laughs> you're not going to sell any records and you're not going to sell any tickets. So, mm, yep. you know, there's good and bad in everything. I, I think for an artist like myself, streaming, of course, isn't really helping, you know, mm, yeah. but for a brand new artist who can get out there, who can promote, their stuff, you know, get on TV or come off of a winning um, uh, one of the shows. Uh, what are yeah. they called, those shows? You know, don't ask uh, us. We don't, we don't know. <laughs> either. Talent or whatever. Britain has talent, you know. Yeah. Or X Factor. Uh, right, right. And then if you win, of course, people are going to stream your stuff down. They're going to yeah. go on their phones. And, <laughs> yeah. Such a difference. Stuff. And the next thing you know, you're selling out concerts, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> That's just such a different era now with the, the social media driven world, isn't it? And it's great in some ways because look at us having a chat all the way from Scotland to yourself over there. There, yeah. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like I say, there's good and bad and everything. That's my opinion. There's good yeah, and yeah. bad and everything. Definitely. I think people are valuing the, 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 the process of writing music a lot more again now and actually physically holding on to music because I think records have actually sold better this year than they have in a long, long time. You know, I think there's actually a lot of people, because me and my girlfriend, we collect records still. We love records, you know, but uh, I think there's people putting value in physically holding on to something and actually right. listen to it that way, you know. So it's kind of going full circle again, I think. Right. But, right. But like you say, streaming, streaming is here to stay, I think, isn't it? <laughs> That's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. Definitely not. And before you know it, you'll be able to sit in your chair, reach up in the air, and tap on something and, and start watching videos and hearing music. <laughs> <laughs> That's a scary world, isn't it? <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. So what, what, what's next then, Dexter? What, what, what have you got? What, how can people support what you're up to now? And where, where can they learn more about what you're doing just now? Because there's such a real resurgence and love for the music now. And people enjoy watching the show and they love learning about the history of the music. So where can they learn more about what you've been up to and what, you're, what you've got coming up? Well, okay. So like I said, I had worked on this album. And so I'm going to put it out and I'm going to put out I got a Christmas single out already that I kind of quietly released last year just to see what people would, how people would think of it. It's features of a vocalist. Her name is Latrice. And, and I wanted to do a Christmas song that was basically about what people thought about Christmas and how it affects them, you know? So it's called Christmas is Love. Uh, It's online. You know, you can go to Amazon or iTunes or Spotify, whatever, and listen to it and get it. You know, but this year I'm a promoted. I I did no marketing or promotion last year. This year I'm looking online for companies 
In other words, I kind of don't want to go with a major distribution. I want to try independent distribution. I Don't get me wrong. The majors are great. They do a wonderful job. But it was tough for me as the years went on, linking with them and, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I, I'm guessing at my age, it's, it's no longer relevant for them. But I want to try to keep my music relevant. As, as far as finding uh, d- different resources in which yep. to uh, promote market and, and release my music. So that's the process I'm starting up now. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And where can they find out more about that? Are you just going to look at it, opening the website up and, uh, and they can... Well, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and start working on my website. I'm, like I said, I'm re-releasing the Christmas song. And, I will, and this year I will market and promote it. Um, and hopefully it will find a, a place I can find one of those online services that will help with that process. And then I'm going to, in the early spring, put out the album. I'm going to do another single release, too. I've done uh, the guy that goes with me and does vocals on the live shows is named Damon Williams. Right. And um, um, he um, was the last signed recording artist at Philly International. Right. Back in the 80s, so um, the late 80s, early 90s. I'm sorry, early 90s. Right. And we travel together and do shows together. Um, and he's singing a, a couple of the songs on the album. And the next single release, the very next single release I do, it's called This Is My Story. I'm going to send it to you. Right. I'm going I'm to mm-hmm. email it, the single. I just edited it the other day. From an album link down to a single. And what I wanted to do with that song was I wanted to mix the sound of classic R&B with the sound of newer R&B, you know, which is more hip hop flavored. But I wanted to mix the two together. So I'm going to send it to you and I want to get your opinion. Okay. No, it sounds good. I'm going to send it to you. I'm going to email it to you. You give me your email address or text me your email address, and I'll send it to you within the hour, and you fellas can listen to it. Really? And give me your opinion, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to marry two two, two ages together. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds incredible. That sounds incredible. Oh, no. to give that. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I, and I hope it works. Yeah, <laughs> you, know? cool. you, you sound <laughs> you know, more inspired. Guys doing all the little background parts, and he's doing the lead, all the lead parts. Yeah. And um, I think he's a phenomenal singer. And and so uh, you'll let me know what you think. Sounds mm-hmm. good. We'll, we'll always support you, Dexter, and what you guys, what you're up to, and things like that. We'll always show our support and try our best. To, that's the reason we get guys like yourself on for a <laughs> chat on here, just to support the musicians and and just and spread the history and just try and uh, help educate people who are getting into the music now, who maybe didn't realize where it came from and what the backstory was. You know, so we'll always do our best to support. I really appreciate that. I really do, fellas. Uh, it it really means a lot. Um, uh, you, you folks over there have been extremely supportive of, of, of cultural music for many, many decades, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I for one, uh, am so happy that that continues to this day. Yeah, yeah. I think, Dexter, I think can I ask as well, what, what kind of advice would you give to like young, maybe aspiring producers or maybe starting to mess around with a bit of synthesis and things like that as well? Is there any advice you would give to people out there that are, are just getting into it? Well, the first thing I would say is do your homework, you know, find, you know, study up on the history of synthesis as far as that's concerned. Um, you know, from the Ars Martinet uh, to the Thur- Thur- Thurman to um, yep. Moog to Arp and so forth and so forth. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And then listen to the sounds, you know, study the sounds, find out what a sine wave is all about, find out what oscillation is all about, so forth, you know. Mm-hmm. And then when you go to your keyboards, find what makes you, what, what rings a bell to you, you know, mm. and then try to develop that. Mm. And once you think you have it at a good place where you think you can really use it, then do that. Just don't, you know, cut a record and say, okay, well, I got a sound here and, and that's it. Yep. Do, do some studying, mm-hmm. you know, learn learn about the sonics that will make you feel best. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Yep. Because you, it, it's what's inside of you that you're going to have to share with the world. What, what you feel about a sound, how you project the sonics 
it's what's going to make you different or acceptable or not not acceptable <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know and that way you learn through the process you learn through your mistakes but you also learn through success you know yeah and and that's the best i can way i can put it that's brilliant brilliant advice that's good, good advice, advice. <laughs> John. <laughs> Brilliant. No, thanks a lot for taking time out to actually have a chat with us. I was going to say, see, in that studio over there, if you ever come across an old dusty synthesizer that uh, slipped through the <laughs> net, you, you make sure you give me and John a call about that, okay? And we'll take that off your hands, all right? <laughs> you know, there's a, the guy that I worked with in February um, who was the MD and bass player on our sh- our shows at the um, at the Jazz Cafe in London and the New Morning in Paris. His name is Ernest McComb. Right. And, and he has, I'm going to send you a picture that he sent me. Yeah. He has all the synthesizers right. like, all like, <laughs> like on display in a room at his house. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we need to, John, we need to go. John, we're taking the- <laughs> we, need, we need to bring you a brother as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, fellas. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Now, don't forget, I'm going to send you. Yep, send uh, And I really want a response. What do you think? Okay, because I'm really trying to marry two two ages together, you know, and you'll hear it. You'll hear the old and you'll hear the new, you know. And just let me know what you think. And I'm still trying to write songs and produce. (laughs) Hopefully we'll see you back in the UK at some point after all this pandemic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was supposed to do a bunch of stuff last year, but uh, I mean, I mean, uh, not last year, this year, but it all got canceled. You know, I was going to do Camp Soul in the UK. I was going to do a few (laughs) other things, go back to the Jazz Cafe. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's uh, Ronnie Scott's had reached out, you know, so all these places had reached out and I we all got shut down. Yeah. Next year, Dexter, you'll come over. We'll go to the Highlands. We'll all go together. Me, John, you, and Judy. We'll have a great time. <laughs> well, listen, I would love to come back to Scotland. So if you know of a promoter over there, please, <laughs> please link him up. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Now you take care of yourself. Look, 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 a good idea would be to go online uh, because all these people that were in the audiences, they made videos and post them on YouTube of the shows of yep. some of the so- songs we did at the Jazz Cafe or at the New Morning. So go take yep. a look, see. Hi, Brilliant. Brilliant. No, thanks a lot, Dexter. It's been an absolute pleasure and we're, we're honoured to have you taking time out to have a chat to us and just tell us a little bit more about that magnificent era and what you're up to now. You're you're more inspired than you've ever been by the sounds of it, I think. You don't stop. <laughs> no, I don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> now you take care, Dexter. We'll chat to you again soon, my friend, all right? Happy holidays, all right, bless- bro. Blessings and peace. Take care.